Emery is uh, very nurturing. She's she's kind and she worries about people. Um, she has a lot of opinions for a five-year-old and a lot of questions. Uh, she asks a lot of questions. Um, and she's very aware that she's different. She's actually very smart and sassy and she gives me a lot of trouble sometimes. Uh, but she's a, she's a sweet kid and her curly hair just fits her personality. So, Emery was born via C-section on December 15th, 2017. Uh, I had a completely normal pregnancy. <clears throat> I was not high risk. Every scan was normal. Everything was completely um, routine. So December 24th, uh, or early morning the 24th 23rd <clears throat> she started not eating I was breastfeeding and she started to just get really lethargic and and super tired and slept a lot and I remember sitting in the rocking chair it was like three in the morning she would not eat and I was just kind of like I was beside myself I was I was upset because I was up at three in the morning with a you know, seven day old. And I was just trying to work through it. Um, we kind of, we got through the night. She still wasn't eating. And then the next day is Christmas Eve. And so we're getting ready in the morning, having breakfast and still trying to get her to eat. And it's kind of, you know, my husband and I are talking about it and we're going back and forth and wondering what's going on. And mid morning, we, um, call the doctor and the doctor calls me back and says, well, you know, it sounds like normal newborn behavior to me. And they were like, well, you know, maybe she's just, you know, we make all these excuses and I sit on it and, you know, I'm just really just kind of watching her at that point for like an hour. I'm just not in the conversation. And I just get up and I said, we got to go to the hospital. So we get to Texas Children's in the Woodlands, which had just opened at that point. Um, Emery was actually the first heart baby uh, at Texas Children's Woodlands. And we get there, and because it's December and she's an infant, we get right back. Uh, so we're back in um, the room, and they start kind of looking at her, poking and prodding, and they're concerned because she hasn't eaten, and she's getting more and more jaundice, more yellow. Um, so they start running tests, uh, RSV, H, HPV, flu, strep, um, and the general consensus is, like, we don't know what's wrong. More and more people start coming in that are progressively higher up the chain. Um, it was not, initially it was just, you know, the nurses, and then it was the, you know, the doctor on call kind of popped in, and then it was a different doctor, and then it was uh, the head of emergency services, and, and so, I knew something was wrong um, and all the tests, you know, they did them, but it was Christmas Eve and they don't have a lot of people there. And so there was a lot of waiting. They're like, well, we got to get an IV in her. You know, we got to get fluids in her um, because something's wrong. And then we'll figure out what's wrong once we get fluids in her. And that proved to be the beginning of the trauma. Um, they stuck her in her arm and then they stuck her in her other arm. And then they tried to get her foot and her veins kept rolling and her veins were flat because she was dehydrated. And then they stuck her in her other foot and then they stuck her in the back of her arm. And then when they got to about 10 times of trying, I was, I was really upset uh, because I was, she was crying, she was in pain, you know, they're sticking the needle in and they're moving it around and she's screaming and I know that she needs this, but I'm also like, you're hurting her and she can't tell you. Um, so they said, well, we're gonna try in her head. Uh, and there's, they explain there's two main veins in, the, in their heads. They let me hold her while they did that and they stuck her in the side of the head trying to get a vein <clears throat> and they couldn't. Um, then they tried the other side and I could tell everybody was pretty frustrated and worried at that point. 
And so the, that's when the director of the ER came in. And, um, and so he said, we're going to have to do an inner osteo. Um, and he explained that it's basically a procedure where they go through the leg bone and they stick a needle into the leg bone. And um, that way they can get a vein through that bone. And so they brought in another team that prepped her and they laid her out and they put out, you know, almost like it was surgery. And um, they asked me to leave the room and uh, it was just, there's nothing worse than hearing your child cry and not being able to fix it. Um, and of course, in true Emory fashion, they got it in and um, she kicked it out. She kicked it out because she was mad. <laughs> and um, so I got in there and they were like, we're gonna have to do it again because she kicked it out. It's a pretty, it's a pretty hard thing to do to get that vein, and um, we need to do it again because she needs she needs fluids. Like we have to do this, and we're gonna we're gonna bring in some people to secure her other legs so she can't kick it out because it's a pretty fragile. Like it's actually straight up and down in their shin, so you can't really. There's not a real good way to to stabilize it. And so um, and he tells me like, you're, you're gonna be admitted. We're gonna, we're gonna admit you tonight and um, make sure that we figure out what's going on. And at this moment, it's still Christmas Eve. It's eight o'clock. We're supposed to be having Christmas dinner. I have a five-year-old that I have to do Christmas for. Um, so I'm worried about him. He's at grandparents with dad. I'm alone, I'm alone. So they start pumping fluids in her and she starts pinking up and, and kind of swelling up a little bit. And I got a little bit worried and they were like, no, that's good. Like she needed the fluids. And, um, so they put her in this thing and they roll us down the hall to go upstairs to the NICU and the director of emergency, um, medical was there. He was with me and helping me roll up. We got in the elevator and her chest just started like, heaving like pumping really hard and um I was like what what's happening and he I'll never forget he said um I'm not real sure but we need we need to hurry so we got up to the room and there was literally nobody in the hospital that night and so it was all hands on deck. Like there were nurses everywhere. There were six nurses and two doctors and and they were just waiting in this room. And um, it was dark in there. uh, And they put her in this little incubator thing and they did, um, you know, everybody's doing something. They're hooking her up, they're doing, and the doctor pulls me inside and we're gonna have to intubate now uh, because she is not breathing well. Um, and it all just kind of escalated so quickly that I was like, what, what's like, why is this going so bad? Like we got fluids in her and it was supposed to be okay. Well, it turns out the fluids that they put in her stressed her body, um, and put her into cardiogenic shock because at that point we didn't know her heart wasn't working, not pumping, not pumping blood to the rest of her organs. And so when we put all of that fluid in her and like we we overran the kidneys and the liver and everything with all that fluid and they were not prepared to be working. They weren't working at all. So they do this thing called blood gas um, and they do this blood gas and I think they take, they, they prick their heel and it gives you like an instant result. And so at that point we, we needed results. We needed to know what was wrong. Um, so they intubated her, which actually wasn't even that traumatic. It was when the nurse handed the doctor, he was talking to me about intubation and what steps they were gonna take and more tests and everything. And um, he was talking about, they need to get blood out of her to test her blood. Because all of the other tests we had done up until that point were like swabs, right? And so Dr. Hoover is the doctor, I'll never forget. He was amazing. Um, I still talk to him and um, he said, we're gonna, we're gonna do everything in our power to figure this out. 
and he starts talking about ammonia levels and CBC and liver enzymes and this and that and it's all just coming at me and he's trying to explain to me what they're doing and I'm just thinking like why are you talking to me like just go do it um, and I kind of zoned out because I was thinking about Christmas uh, and you know it's eight nine ten o'clock by this point uh, so my son has now gone to bed on Christmas night I'm gonna be staying in the hospital things kind of progress and I'm just kind of sitting there watching and there's people going in and out and he says well I need I need you to step into the hallway uh, and it was about 1130 um, and he said we we can't get blood out of her we need to do um, an umbilical line she still had her umbilical cord attached I and mean, she had, it hadn't even fallen off yet that's how little she was and um, he said, I'm, I'm gonna have to go in through her belly button and do a UAV, and it's a pretty risky procedure, but we need to do it right now because we need to get blood out of her. And I'm gonna ask you to step out, and when you step out, I need you to go call your family. Um, and I said, well, what? Why, why would we need to call our family? Um, and he said, well, we're really trying to figure it out, but she's declining fast, and I'm not sure she's gonna make it through the night. And um, I just, I just lost it. Um, I just, I didn't know how I was gonna go home without a baby. Um, what do I do with all her stuff? Um, because in my mind, like, the fact that he said that meant that, like, we're, this is a pretty good, per like, possibility. And so he asked us to step out, um, and he comes back, like, an hour later. It seemed like three hours. Um, and he said, well, I got the line in, so that's good. Um, I just kept thinking that I'm, like, that I did it, that I did something wrong, um, because I like the way that she grew or, or I got her sick or I took her somewhere that I shouldn't have. And so I had a lot of guilt about that. Um, so he gets the UAV line in and he's like, this is good. We can get blood out of her now. Um, but we need to do an x-ray to make sure because it's, it's basically the, it, the vein, the artery that is in their belly button that connects them to mom that they're going through at that point. And again, it's a pretty, it's a temporary solution uh, to, get, um, to get blood out of the baby to test to find out what's wrong. And, and so it's not very stable. So he let me walk over there and see her, but she's got all this white tape on her belly holding this vein that he basically said like, if I would have gotten that wrong, she would have bled out. And so he says, well, we're going to call in a cardiologist on call because her heart looked a little enlarged when we did the x-ray to check the placement of the UAV. He's in there and he, she's sedated, so he's doing an um, echo on her. It wasn't a sonogram, it was an echo. It had a little thing and he's squirting this stuff and he's moving around and he's looking at the screen and it was almost like one of those computers like from when you were a kid that had like all the green writing and it looked really really old and he said I think I know what it is I was like really he was like yeah um it's a I think I see a coarctation of her aorta come here and look basically where her aorta had kinked and then opened up and so blood was not going not flowing through her aorta to her heart the heart that oxygenates the blood and sends all of the blood to the other organs was basically like, stuck it was just um like a traffic jam he said i i felt so much hope and relief at that point because i thought okay finally like i can see with my eyes and this is it. And so they roll in a different crew that then gets her to where she's stabilized. They put her in this machine and we go in an ambulance down, um, down the Hardy at three in the morning on Christmas Eve. And um, 
like lights and sirens and uh, they get her up, they take us up to this cardiovascular ICU, which is specific to Texas Children's and um, we get her settled. They realize, you know, they're confirming that they, it is in fact a coarctation of the aorta. They explained to me that, you know, she's gonna have to have surgery, but we're gonna let her body recover and uh, for a couple days because her organs were, were in failure and they need to make sure that she's strong enough to go through surgery. And so they, they gave her medicine to open up her PDA line, which is something that babies need when they're in mom's tummy. So the PDA line is specifically an artery that goes from baby to mom that takes oxygenated blood uh, because they don't have to oxygenate their own blood. They get mom's oxygenated blood. And so this is a specific vein that exists for a specific reason while baby is in utero. And the next morning, which is the 26th, uh, I go and um, go for rounds because that's I'm realizing now like this is this is where you get the information and the plan for the day. So I'm like I'm gonna be there 7 a.m. I don't even know what's going on. Well, rounds take hours, uh, <clears throat> and Emery was the last one on rounds, so it was probably 11 o'clock noon by the time that they had gotten around to her. There was that many kids, and. Um, they do rounds and then the nurse comes and says, um, so the plan for today has changed um, and Emery's gonna go into surgery soon. And I was like, well, what? Like I thought we were waiting a couple days and she said, well, um, the medicine that was helping her isn't working anymore and so we need to do surgery sooner. So then we go into like, panic mode. So we sit down finally with the surgeon about um, 5 p.m. I mean, I guess I thought the surgeons went home at 5. They don't. They did. He was there all day and he was going to do the surgery after hours and I just thought that was so strange. Um, and so we sit down with him and he explains to us that um, her heart is the size of a strawberry at that point and he's going to go in and he's going to cut out the part of her aorta that is kinked and then he's gonna sew it back together and hopefully that will fix the problem um, he was also gonna go in and sew up a hole that she had an, an ASD um, is what they call it in her heart um, and that she had another hole in her heart which is pretty common but they were gonna leave that one and um, you know, he's like, well, do you have any questions before you sign the paperwork? Yeah, a lot. Um, you know, but you can't even think of the right questions in that time because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so I asked him the survival rate and he wouldn't really say. He said, you know, the survival rate is good, uh, but I, don't, I won't know until I get in there. Um, and he explained to me the process. So... Basically, they were going to cut open her chest and um, ice her heart down to stop it. And they were going to put her on a heart and lung machine so they could then do the repair. And then they were going to warm her back up and um, watch the blood flow to make sure everything was correct. And then they were going to sew her back up. Okay. Um, I was hopeful because I felt like, all right, we've got a plan, we've got an answer, like, this is going to be okay, but I was scared to death. Um, I couldn't wrap my head around how they could open a baby up like that and just do things um, and then close her. Uh, so she went into surgery about uh, 6.30, and um, the surgery was seven and a half hours long. Um, and this wonderful nurse came out like every 30 minutes and talked to us and told us what they were doing, um, that they had gotten her open. And, uh, you know, at that point they were icing her down and stopping her heart. And then they were connecting the heart and lung machine. And so she would have four parts on her heart that, um, where they connected the tubes to the heart and lung machine. And then, 
she came back and said, okay, they've, they've got her on the heart and lung machine. So it was, all, it was always just like, all right, this is the next step. We got through that step. And so she came back in and said that they had made the repair and that it went well. Um, and that they were at the most critical step now, which was to get her off the heart and lung machine and make sure that the repair took. Um, and then I, I remember her coming out and she had the biggest smile on her face and I thought, okay, like we're gonna be okay. And so the, yeah, and she got, uh, she got sewn up and she has uh, three wires now keeping her chest together um, under her skin because they had to crack her sternum. And um, the nurse explains to me like, all right, she's gonna be intubated and um, she's gonna be on dialysis. And um, you know, you can come see her as soon as she gets out, but it's gonna be, you need to prepare yourself. It's gonna look really bad. She looked really broken, like just, her little legs were just splayed out and open and she was just, almost just like a shell. Um, and they just kept saying like, she's doing good, the dialysis is working, this, and I just, what I was seeing was not um, aligning with what they were telling me. And so I just had this constant worry and doubt and they, they made me go home um, at that point. They were like, you have to leave, nothing's gonna happen. Like we have a nurse dedicated to her, you need to go get some rest. Um, and so I went back to the hotel and rested. And um, the next 13 days were probably the most frustrating uh, of my life because it was a lot of waiting and wondering and it was just all up to her. But I remember, I think the biggest win besides us getting to go home was when they extubated her. And that was the whole ordeal, right? Like every day it was like, we don't think she's ready to extubate. We don't think she's ready. We don't think she's strong enough. About six days in, they said, okay, we're gonna extubate her now. And, and the reason that they had decided that was because they, was, they were slowly turning the machine down and she was slowly breathing on her own. And so when they got down to about, um, 60% of the machine and 40% her doing it uh, was when it was like, all right, now we need her at this much. And then, oh, well, she's breathing over the machine now, so that's good. And so when she was breathing over the machine consistently is when they decided to extubate her. And we got to be there for it. Um, and so the respiratory therapist came in and the doctors were all standing by in case anything went wrong. And we were standing there and she, you know, they counted and they pulled the little thing and they pulled it out and she kind of, she kind of paused and she took a breath on her own. She's laying out and she looks over and there's like a smile on her face. And I swear everybody in there was like, that's amazing. <laughs> like you're, 12 day old is smiling right now like so um so yeah we got moved down to a step down unit uh about a week after that and just trying to figure out how to hold her but it was it was also great because I was I felt like okay we're we're on the upside of this um so yeah we got to go home they told us that we could go home it was like nine o'clock at night on a Thursday night and there was traffic for some reason and I'm you know my husband is with my son all this time I do a lot of this alone and um, when they told us that we could go home he was like well I'll come get you and I was like no the car is here I'm getting it I'm packing it like I'm coming home I want to come home <laughs> I'm, I don't care how late it is I'm, we're coming home and so um, I left that hospital with so much stuff um, just clothes and gifts and things that we had accumulated and she started growing and gaining weight and the rest is history. Um, and she knows that she had surgery. She knows that her heart was, was broken and that they had to go in and fix it. And um, the 
that she's very special and brave because of that because not not many people get to do that so that is a really story The best way to support the American Heart Association's mission is to support their events, like the Heart Walk. Uh, we're having the Heart Walk uh, this year on October 28th. You can join a team, you can start a team, you can donate to a team, you can donate to an individual person. Um, companies sponsor this walk, and all of it is to raise money to help support the research that American Heart Association does. The best way to find a walk near you or our walk is go to heart.org and search by your zip code and you can find a way to get involved with the Heart Walk or even just attend the day of and support the mission.